So without further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker, um, who is Matteo Fumagalli um, from the School of International, Senior Lecturer at the School of International Relations at um, St. Andrews, where I studied for my master's over a decade ago. So I um, have very fond memories of, of, of the department. And Matteo will give us an overview of Korea's relations uh, with the region and I think very broad brush strokes that he's uh, a leading expert on Korea's relations with Central Asia. So we're very honored to have him here uh, with us today. So I'll hand over to Matteo who will speak and then we'll hand over to Professor Kang. Thank you, Ed, for your very kind introduction. So good morning, afternoon and evening. Um, everyone, let me start by, um, first of all, thanking Ed and Marquis and the Davis Center and the Oxo Society for Central Asian Affairs. I'm really honored to be here uh, today and also um, delighted to see many uh, friendly faces in, in the audience and some friends and, and authors of pieces that um, uh, I found inspiring in my own work. Um, let me share this screen here, hang on a second, if I manage to dig out the slide, yes, All right, so just a second, do you see the, the slides? We do, we do. All right, perfect. Yeah. So um, rather than repeating the the title. Um, let me just say what I'm trying to do in this talk and more broadly in my research on South Korea and Central Asian relations. Essentially, the aim is twofold. On the one hand, I'm interested in understanding the rationale, the drivers, um, the tools that Korea uses to engage the Central Asian republics and Central Asian societies. And uh, what I'm trying to do is an appraisal or, or basically provide gen a general overview today in, in the time that I have of this relationship. But more broadly, I'm interested in um, figuring out an answer to um, a simple question. That is, what kind of actor, what kind of international actor is South Korea, particularly in Central Asia? Is it more of a rule taker or a rule maker and this play on words of between payer and player speaks to that. Now, in, uh, in my talk on a, a drone research carried out in the Central Asian Republics and in South Korea over the years, some of it was, um, was published in, in journals that the piece on the Korean diaspora in Bishkek comes out in three days in the European Journal of Korean Studies. And then I draw most of my talk on the monograph that is coming out for Paul Grave next year, where I look at connections between Asian countries that are not mediated by China. They're not driven by China. They're not established or set up against China, but there's life that goes on beyond this large and important country. And I want to explore that. Now, my initial interest in the topic um, builds on or was driven by a broader research on ethnic minorities in Central Asia. And here you see me standing outside the Koreski Narod Nedom in Bishkek, the, one of the institutions that were established that, that exist in Kyrgyzstan to promote uh, Korean culture, language and ties with Korea. And I was interested in the topic because of the unusual or well, it was unusual at the very beginning when I first bumped into this, this subject, the presence of ethnic Koreans in Central Asia. We've got about half a million ethnic Koreans across the post-Soviet space. Um, the majority of those are living in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. About 35% are in Russia. The plurality of those are in the Far East with a large presence in Sakhalin, although the origins of the Sakhalin Koreans are very different from the Central Asian ones who are the descendants of those Koreans deported by Stalin in 1937. Uh, and those that were deported there were themselves descendants of farmers and peasants initially and political dissidents later. 
that left the Korean Peninsula starting from the early 1860s, and then the immigration, legal and illegal, except to the Russian Empire accelerated after Korea's incorporation into the and annexation by the Japanese Empire uh, in 1905, 1910. So that's an interesting topic that um, deals with questions of identity transformation, notions of homeland, um, the erosion of identity bound, boundaries or the maintenance of, of those. And that's what sparked my interest in, in this subject. That said, it is not the local Koreans that drive the relationship between the Central Asian Republics and the Republic of Korea. So let me move on. So let's start from the inside out first. I mean, typically when looking at the role of the roles of uh, new actors in, in a particular region, one zooms in immediately on what they do. But let me actually start from what the Central Asian states wanted from this relationship and what they needed. Now, priority number one, as is well known in the 1990s, was state building. Now, to that end, what was needed was the holy trinity of capital, technology, and expertise, of which, for a number of reasons, historical reasons, and the, the power asymmetry and the colonial legacies, um, there was very little in, in the region. So the, um, the elite in powers, as they tried to re rebuild the economies and build a new state, reached out to whoever was interested and Korea alongside Japan was among the countries and of course Russia for again historical reasons was very interested in developing ties in new markets. Now this was very useful for the Central Asian Republics not because Korea represented an alternative to Russia, China, the United States, various European countries, Turkey, Iran or India, but because it helpfully provided things that were needed and the country appeared to be genuinely interested in what the Central Asian Republics needed. So a notion that in the development world is known as local ownership. The agenda seemed to be driven from the region. Now, of course, there were interests that were specific to Korean, and we can get to this later. But basically, the Central Asian elites managed to leverage their positions um, and their relationship with South Korea to diversify their foreign economic relations, attract investment, and diversify foreign policies. There were three constituencies that were particularly active. Uh, I don't mean to put them all on the same level because again, the power asymmetries are evident, but the local elites benefited because having a wider range of partners contributed to domestic regime consolidations. Shuttle traders could travel to the Gulf or South Korea. And by doing so, they managed to cope with the socioeconomic hardship of the 1990s. And the local ethnic Koreans benefited from the various educational uh, programs that uh, Seoul offered to them. Now, enter Korea, and I don't have time to do this, I do in, to a greater extent in, uh, in, in the book. But um, the main enabling factors that explain why South Korea is in Central Asia are on a macro level, the end of the Cold War that led to the establishment of diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union and a growing economic prowess domestically first and internationally later that saw Korea over a space of two to three decades turn from a donor, from, from an aid recipient country to a donor. Initially, Central Asia was an unknown quantity Russia was the priority. Within Russia, there was the question of the Sakhalin Koreans and more generally the relationship between Russia, Korea, and Japan. But gradually, um, Korea and Korean scholars as well started to uh, recognize the existence of local Koreans that now play an interesting role in the strategy. I mean, they're mentioned in the white paper of 2019. Uh, I don't have time to go through the, the literature here. The main point I want to make is very simply that although there's a really an expanding, a booming industry of studies of Korean foreign policy, the post-Soviet space plays a marginal role therein and Central Asia in particular. Now I'm thinking of the work of Laruel um, Perus, Alex Cooley, and particularly Timur Dadabayev as the exceptions to the rule here. The rest of the literature on Middle powers, 
the new donors, general changes of Korean foreign policy doesn't focus on Central Asia. And that's a pity and that's a gap I'm trying to bridge here because that's a story of after development dynamics. It's a story of uh, what Korea does to deal with issues that have emerged inside the country, the changing economic structure of the country. But it's also a way to shed light on how Korea engages with countries that are not in its immediate neighborhood. Now, I want to make three points in the time that remains. First of all, and again, I'm starting from my broader, uh, the big picture, and then come to the micro gradually, is that Korea is projecting a master narrative when it engages with Central Asia. And that narrative is that of revolves around the sharing of the experience as a developing turn developed country. So it's not a question of model. Uh, nobody likes to talk about models. Nobody likes to project models and even less, no, even fewer people like to be told to follow a model. But there's an element of sharing experiences without the geopolitical baggage that accompanies other countries the US, Russia, and China, that Korea projects abroad. Now, this is, a, I argue, a selective narrative, or it involves selective memory. Now, it's not for me to say what Korea should or shouldn't do, but I think it's very difficult to understand Korea's story if we only focus on state development in the 1970s without looking at the same time at the democratization story of the 1980s. But when we look at the way in which Korea engages with Central Asia, the second part of the story is just not there. One could make the case that that's precisely what helps Korea in deepening relations with countries like Uzbekistan, for example, but all the other Central Asian countries. Um, and one could make the same point there. Um, basically, human rights, democratic governance tend to be underplayed. Not in the white paper, not in the official strategies, but when it comes to um, political relations, that's not, it's, this is downplayed. The second point is that Korea has adopted a multi-pronged strategy that revolves on high level diplomacy. Um, that basically means that every president from uh, Numoyan onwards has had his or her own presidential initiative focused on Eurasia, Central Asia in the case of President No, uh, the post-Soviet space in the case of President Ibak, and Russia plus Central Asia in the case of President Moon. Once one looks at the, at, the, at the concrete initiatives, there's a clear thread that speaks to the coherence of Korea's approach, <laughs> despite, ironically, efforts at showing discontinuities. Um, but that's more the result of the partisan nature of Korea's uh, policy making and foreign policy making, which manifests more clearly in relations with the US and uh, North Korea and less with Central Asia. What this meant in practice is a combination of bilateral and multilateral ties. What you see in the table on the left is the number of summits, which in the case of Central Asian visits to, to Korea typically meant uh, visits by the president, but not only. And in central, uh, Korean uh, officials visiting basically meant presidents, and that's the, the figure in the brackets, and prime ministers, foreign ministers, or deputy foreign ministers. What you see here is that obviously Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have attracted a lot of attention. Alongside bilateral ties, Korea has invested quite a lot of uh, capital in the establishment of multilateral fora like the Korea Central Asia Cooperation Forum that brings together well, government officials, NGOs, academics, business people. Uh, that basically takes place annually. Relations have been recently upgraded to a secretariat, which basically means that a joint permanent institution has been established. And very recently, a creation of a business council, well, the focus of which is in the name. Now, Professor Kang will deal more with economic trends. So I just leave you with um, a cursory overview. Uh, what I think you get from from this slide and the next is that Korea has diversified the relationship with the region in the sense that it doesn't treat the five as an undistinguished collection of five Central Asian republics. 
the story of Central Asian relation of Korea's relationship with Central Asia is a story of Seoul's relationship with Uzbekistan first and Kazakhstan, and that's reflected in the provision of development aid as a way to create political goodwill in the relationship. Basically, Uzbekistan has received over the last 20 years twice the amount that all the other four republics have received combined. Um, with some variation of different sectors have received uh, greater attention over the years or across the country. Fishery and forestry clearly take the lion's share of Koika's uh, aid in the case of Kyrgyzstan, whereas public administration is more relevant in the case of Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Um, again, here the story is of a relationship primarily with Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and the three others are, are really marginal. You have the column of Russia on the right, just to give you some context of how, how, well, the relationship with the other larger post-Soviet Republic, Russia, really overshadows um, the relationship with all the other post-Soviet countries. But that's not a negligible relationship, and that's growing, it's deepening there. But I'll stop here, and I'm sure uh, Professor Kang will add more. What I find personally interesting is Seoul's emphasis on cultural diplomacy. Less the link of soft power uh, and more of people-to-people -people contacts, which in the case of Central Asia has taken the form of the promotion of Korean studies, Korean language, um, through the Korea Foundation, an organization that operates under the umbrella of the foreign ministry. For full disclosure, I've also been involved in a large Korea Foundation project. Um, Global eSchool that basically delivered online education to a variety of countries. Our project took play, uh, well, basically involved 24 universities in 18 countries in Asia and Europe. And in Central Asia, we were working with um, two universities in Kyrgyzstan, one in Tajikistan and one in Kazakhstan. Um, alongside this, which basically takes the, the lion's share of Korea's activities there, there has been a liberalization of the visa regime that has enabled a greater number of ethnic Koreans to travel to Korea, uh, taking advantage of the F4 visa that belatedly, but well, eventually fortunately enough, came to include both the Korea Saram, the Central Asian Koreans, and the Joseon Jok, China's Koreas, and then the H2 visa uh, from 2007 onwards, which enabled people to visit and work South Korea, although not quite to get permanent residence. It's estimated that there is about 40,000 Korea Saram in South Korea, officially at least, uh, 28,000 people on H2 and F4 visas, Clearly, not everybody is on, is on one of those visas. But basically, what I've tried to do so far is to give an overview of the broadening and the deepening of the linkages between Central Asia and Korea, driven by a combination of high-level diplomacy and then aid, trade, and investment, an approach that has, tail has been tailored to the individual needs and priorities of the different countries, which I think has been very well uh, welcomed by by the countries in, in question. Um, to answer my initial question, and I conclude, has Korea, when it comes to Central Asia, turned or morphed from being a payer, a country that contributed significantly and is an important commercial partner and development partner? Has it become a player, a country that basically contributes to shape local order? a country that contributes to lead in certain sectors, it could be renewables, could be government. And I'm not entirely sure whether all these linkages have yet managed to become a leverage that could make Korea more significant, a potentially more significant country there. Um, I think I'm probably out of time, so I'll stop here and I'll hand over to Ed and Nargis. So. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Matteo, for a fantastic overview. I think there's lots to delve into yeah, in the Q and A um, from your your uh, presentation. So next, we're going to hear from uh, Professor Sung Jin Kang, who is a professor in the Department of Economics and the director of the Institute of um, uh, economic or Institute for Economic Research at Korea University, who's going to delve into some of the economic 
linkages between Korea and Central Asia. So over to you, Professor Kang. Uh, thank you for the inviting me to uh, giving me a chance to talk about our uh, research. Uh, I, I will skip to some part of the, uh, of the overlap with uh, Professor Matthew's, Matthew's uh, presentation. The first of all, let me uh, go over the first pages. That, the, that is a summary of the, uh, by the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Korea. Korea had, and the five Central Asian countries have forged a remarkably cooperative partnership since the establishment uh, of diplomatic relations in 1992. Since 1992, we have uh, some summaries uh, at the of the summit quite uh, in, in, since 19, 2019. So since 1992, we, uh, there, there have been uh, 16 uh, summit with Uzbekistan, 14 summit with Kazakhstan, and uh, five summit uh, with Turkmenistan, two summit with Kyrgyzstan, and the three uh, summit with uh, Tajikistan. So since 2007, you can see the summary at uh, this part, the annual Korea and Central Asian Cooperation Forum is headed by vice uh, foreign ministers and the Korean Central Asian Cooperation Forum Secretariat was launched uh, on July uh, 2017, which is the permanent uh, the secretariat established for the purpose of facilitating and cultural cooperation between Korea and Central Asia. So there is some summary of the summit. And then let's go over the some uh, trade FDI and foreign aid part. The export from Korea to five Central Asian countries was about 3.9 billion US dollars in 2020. Uh, most of them are to Uzbekistan, uh, to 48% to Uzbekistan and 41% to Kazakhstan. So other three countries, the share of the other countries are very small relative to Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. So main exporting goods uh, were uh, auto component, cars and chemical machinery uh, uh, until recently. And most of the uh, uh, exporting goods to other countries, uh, including the uh, uh, four Asia, Asian countries, heavy chemical industrial product. But for the exception is the Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan case, some proportion of exporting goods are uh, mainly light industrial goods, uh, although the proportion is decreasing in recent years. So most of the main partners, for both main trade partners uh, are Uzbekistan and uh, uh, Kazakhstan. So the other three countries are uh, very small in terms of the uh, proportion of the total export to, uh, from Korea. The, the import is also, uh, you can see the trend of the import by countries. So uh, the, the import to Korea from uh, five Central Asian countries is about 1.1 billion US dollars in 2010. Uh, 2020, so most of them are from Kazakhstan. The 98% is from Kazakhstan. The so main importing goods are uh, raw materials, basically uh, the oil and uh, raw materials. The exception is from uh, Turkmenistan. In 2012, the main importing good from Turkmenistan was uh, capital goods that is amount to uh, about uh, 458,000 US dollars. But that is not that high from the uh, uh, 2020 point of view. And also from, for example, in 2014, the 3.5 billion US dollars of capital goods were imported. So may, but anyway, uh, even with the there and the main export importing goods are crude oil and raw materials. The only exception is uh, the, in 2012, Turkmenistan and 2014, Kyrgyzstan. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the main export import from Kazakhstan as well. So in terms of commodities, crude oil and raw materials, in terms of countries, the Kazakhstan is the main uh, importing partner. See the 
And Professor Mathieu mentioned already about the uh, ODA. The left graph, left graph uh, uh, implies the, in, uh, the ODA grant. The figure six included the total uh, ODA, including grant and loans. So uh, total, uh, let's see, total bilateral ODA uh, it shows about uh, the uh, increasing trend over increasing about 10 times in, uh, in 2019 compared to uh, 2006. So, so you can see the how much the foreign aid increased from 2006 to 2019. That is about 10 times higher uh, compared to uh, 2006. And also the, from there on throughout the, this period, the Uzbekistan, has received the most ODA uh, the, with, uh, even with the very fa uh, fastest uh, growth. Recently, the, we are working with Uzbekistan government uh, to in, in the establishing a solar power plant uh, uh, with the uh, Korean Exim Bank. That is one of the, uh, uh, the recent trend with, in terms of the, uh, the ODA program. That is, but that is basically loan rather than grant. And also the main part of the uh, ODA a grant in terms of grant, that is the data, collect, data collected by the COICA is mainly social infrastructure and service. That is the main uh, uh, the, uh, sectors with the ODA grant. And uh, that, in, uh, for example, if you go over in detail in since 2006, uh, social infrastructure and services, which included the project and the services, Relate to education, health, population, uh, drinking water, public policy, etc. And then production sectors uh, are agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, industry, and trade. Is uh, that is uh, the main part of the uh, ODA grant? You can see the uh, trend of the uh, ODA grant to Central Asia by sectors. Let's move to the FDI. Uh, but FDI trend shows are to be increasing comparing to the ODA a, a grant and loans. So you can see the, uh, uh, the FDI outflows to Central Asia from Korea. Uh, so that is a decrease, actually decrease. For example, the, the peak year is about 2008, 2009, this period. So, uh, so that, uh, for example, if you compare the uh, foreign data invest outflows, from uh, between 2010 and 2020, the total FDA outflows in 2010 was 182 million US dollars, but that decreased very significantly in 2020 uh, to uh, 34 uh, million US dollars. So there is a huge decrease, but that is because of the huge FDA outflows uh, to uh, the uh, it, during the 2009 and 2010, uh, 2008, 2009, just before the financial crisis. So uh, during that time, the major FDI sectors are changing from manufacturing and resource development to service industry, such as uh, finance and insu uh, the insurance sectors. So let's look at the Kazakhstan. Why that has a peak in. Uh, 2007 and 2008, just before the financial crisis. In the case of Kazakhstan, since 2005, FDI, from here you can see the, uh, the FDI outflow from Korea to uh, Kazakhstan, increased from the uh, 25.6 million US dollars to uh, 249. Uh, million US dollars in one year. So that is uh, the huge increase in 2006, 7, 8, especially the 2008. In one, uh, that uh, in 2008, that was the uh, highest in uh, FDA outflows to, uh, that was about 822 million US dollars. That is that this period, you see, in 2008. But after that one, there was a huge decreasing trend over years. Uh, in 2000, in, in by sectors in 2008, the Kazakhstan received uh, 
uh, the foreign direct investment in finance and insurance sectors and also real estate sectors. So after the financial crisis, that FDA outflow decreased very significantly. But that is the only exception uh, on FDI outflows from Korea to Central Asia. But for the other period and for other countries, the FDA outflows are not that high come, uh, if you look at the uh, graph. For this 10 to 15 years, Turkmenistan received the lowest FDI inflows. So Turkmenistan is not that popular for Korean companies. But interestingly, you can see, if you look at the, uh, the right-hand side graph, so although FDI inflows to Central Asia shows a decrease or a stable trend, number of newly established Korean firms in, uh, a, has an increasing trend throughout the period. Okay, if you look at the, uh, the right-hand side of picture graphs, there are uh, 76 newly established Korean firms in Uzbekistan in 2019. So the total amount of FDI include, you can say the kind of stable with low uh, amount, except for the, uh, the uh, those, uh, 2007 and 2008 period. But number of companies, of uh, newly established companies tend to shows increasing trends, then that means the FDA outflows per company has been very, very decreased or lower over time. And then you can see the some very recent to uh, FDI, uh, uh, the can be FDI or some uh, foreign uh, uh, the ODA program that they have recently SKENC on January 7th, 27, 2021, SK Engineering and Construction signed the exclusive contract with the Uzbekistan government for modernization of Uzbek thermal power plant. That is kind of new trend uh, of Korean ODA by loan or foreign direct investment to uh, Central Asia, not only to Central Asia, Mongolia, and Russia are the same, the kind of the, uh, the rehabilitation of the old uh, the power plant. And then that is a, a, a most important part uh, on, on the relation between Korea and the, uh, the Central Asian countries. You can see the, the recent government policies of two, three ma major uh, Central Asian countries to diversify their development uh, development uh, strategy in terms of sectors. But they try to uh, 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 consider that they try to consider the kind of a new style, uh, the renovation process of, for example, the digital Kazakhstan and smart city. So smart city sector is quite popular, not only for Central Asia, but also for, uh, for the uh, Vietnam and other uh, South Asian countries. That because, in my opinion, that is because the, the construction and the uh, uh, cities was constructed under socialism regime before the uh, 1990 period. So most of the cities need some rehabilitation, including housing. So they are really, really requesting those sectors to Korean government in terms of smart cities or social housing. So that uh, reflects the, the development, development strategies uh, uh, in, in, of Central Asia. As I mentioned, that is not only for Central Asian countries. The, the other East, uh, East Asian countries, for example, Vietnam, uh, is requesting the smart city project for, to the Korean government. And also uh, the table the, in four uh, it's the key areas of cooperation between the South Korea and the three major Central Asian government. In, in traditionally, in short term government, we strengthen uh, cooperation in manufacturing industries, those are uh, uh, many industries such as textile, agricultural machinery, and automobiles and planted construction. But uh, in medium long term period, the government will establish uh, partnerships in new sectors, new industries, such as medical field, including digital and digital, and also ICT and the aerospace industries. So that, that's kind of the transition period uh, in terms of the main targeting sectors between Korea and other Central Asian countries. 
the traditional manufacturing sectors from the traditional manufacturing sectors and also resource sectors to uh, kind of new uh, industries, including the medical and ICT. So that is kind of the uh, uh, transition period. Secondly, the cooperation part, the Professor Matteo already mentioned about the Korean development experiences. So we call the knowledge sharing program that was uh, 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 the, the knowledge sharing program is a platform for development cooperation uh, to share knowledge with the partner countries uh, the, in terms of the economic development. As you know, the Korean economic development strategy, what development experience was achieved under dictatorship, right? Not democratic institution. So that is quite popular for developing countries because most of them are under dictatorship. That is my personal opinion. But anyway, in terms of economic sense, we have uh, we achieved a very significant, the very uh, high level of income per capita. But in terms of uh, institutional framework, we are we were on the quite strong dictatorship. What we call that is a government-led development strategy. So that is quite different from the the uh, the uh, point of view of uh, the U.S. and European countries. And, and so. It, if you have interest, you can take a look at the, uh, the case studies uh, in terms of the knowledge sharing program. So uh, mainly, the, that, that is one of the uh, interesting thing is the, the Uzbekistan Naboi uh, free economic free industrial economic zone uh, stories. So uh, I, I, I will, uh, for, for example, the one of the major achievement of KSB in Central Asia is uh, Naboi a free industrial economic zone policy consultation in, in Uzbekistan. But I, I will not go over that issue in detail because of time. So if we have interest, then you can share the, my PowerPoint to, uh, uh, to, to uh, get more information. But in conclusion, why the, the Professor uh, Mati shows the government strategies uh, over the government president. So left-wing government have interest in to the northern part of uh, Korean Peninsula, but the right-wing uh, president or government have interest in the southern part of the Korean Peninsula because of North Korea and China. So the left-wing government have, uh, has to continue the relation with North Korea and China. So they, they, that is why we are trying to have a very good close relationship with the Central Asia, Mongolia, China, and Russia. So if we have uh, the more, uh, uh, the strengthen the network with the Europe, uh, European country and US, they try to strengthen the relation with the southern part of Penish, uh, the South, uh, Korean Peninsula, like Vietnam, Cambodia, and Japan. So that is a little bit uh, uh, Korean. That is my opinion, but that is, that is uh, my personal opinion. So, and secondly, the Korean uh, has a much uh, interest with the resource, natural resource. And also, as he mentioned, we have uh, uh, try to co uh, context the Korean people we call Korea in. So that is the main three point why the Korean government has much interest in uh, Central Asia in, in terms of Korea in Korean and the, the relation with North Korea and finally the resource, natural resource trade. Thank you, that, that is. So if you have interest, you can, you can share the PowerPoint.